So we're going to do similarly to just the other day where I'll just have my laptop turned around and, you, and we could all kind of hopefully see a little bit. Um, and we'll continue and take them there. We will not lose. We will not be confounded. Like not even close, actually. Uh, God always makes a way out of what seems to be no way. And so um, I'm perfectly comfortable only by his grace to work with what we got. There will be a time where we're not going to have all this technology and these uh, beneficial tools that assist us in the preaching of the gospel of Jesus. Uh, but with having it here, we'll take full advantage and full use of it. So anyway, no more talking about the problems, but let's talk about the problem solver. What do you say? Amen. Amen. So we've been studying, we've been studying the word of God, and here we are at our, uh, the final classes of the school of the prophets, and I just thank God again so much for all the light that he has been shedding our way. We have been richly, richly blessed. And even until now, I, I can't grasp everything, even it is that I'm sharing with you. I know it is, that it's true because the Bible says it, but it goes much deeper. It goes much further. It's much broader. It's much wider. Uh, and God has sought fit to share it with babes, you and me. And here we are blessed to be able to learn these things for a reason in particular. Do you believe that God has placed us here just by coincidence? You think it's just, you know, it just happens and you just end up skating your way in here, just, you know, here, here you are. No, God, there's a, there's a statement from the book Ministry of Healing. It's on page 417. On page 417 of the book Ministry of Healing, it says, Above the distractions of the earth, God sits enthroned. All things are open to his divine survey. And from his great and calm eternity, he ordains that which his providence sees as best. So from eternity, God has ordained that on this day, this group would be here and we would be studying a most important subject as it relates to time. It's not, again, a coincidence that we're here. We've had the chance to take a look at a few things. We had the chance to take a look at the fact that we are that there are, it sounds, like, it sounds like we have power, amen? It sounds like a little, I hear the microphone uh, just kind of popped on. Oh, but take it, oh, we have to turn it on. Boom, there it is. Okay, so let us get the laptop. We'll get that connected and you can see on a much larger screen. You see, you see God is good. And so, you know, we don't, we don't concern ourselves too much with that which seems to be an issue. Okay, so we were studying, we were studying, and we're looking at time. We're looking at time, and we're understanding the importance of it as it relates to you and as it relates to me. This study, again, I'll, I'll preface this study to let you guys know that um, as far as I'm concerned, it is a deep study. Um, it is a quote-unquote troubling study because it brings you face-to-face -face with your maker. It lets you know that it, it could actually be you that will welcome Jesus when he comes. And so you've got to have it in your heart to love the coming of the Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, we have to love the coming of Jesus. So what we've been looking at, just in a brief little sketch, in a brief little sketch, we saw that there are seven angels in Revelation chapter 14. Right? Seven angels means seven movements. This represents the, seven, the final movements of earth's history before Jesus returns to this world. So the 14th chapter of the Revelation is a most important chapter for us to comprehend. And from it, we need to understand quite a bit from the Word of God. Because the, every book in the Bible meets in the book of Revelation. And in the 14th chapter thereof, there we will find many, everything pertaining to you and pertaining to me. So we also saw that there were seven churches, right? There were seven churches. And with those seven churches, those are the seven periods of God's people before the second coming of Jesus, right? Now with those seven churches, we focused in on the last three churches in our previous studies. Well, we'll just do the last three just for now and we'll clarify it some more. 
And the last three were Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Church number five is Sardis, and then after that, Philadelphia, and then Laodicea was church number seven. So you see the seven churches. Now within, within the final three churches, we find that the seven angels movement would begin. We find that Revelation chapter 14 fits right in from the church of Sardis until the last. So when you allow the word of God to put that right in, what did we see from those final uh, three churches? We see that the first angels movement was sent, began in order to save Sardis. The church during the time of Sardis, the people during the time of the church of Sardis, they weren't preparing themselves for the second coming of Jesus. They needed to understand that you need to prepare your hearts right now. You need to prepare yourself to meet your maker. And so to prepare those people, God sent the first angel's message through a man by the name of, do you remember his name? What was his name? William Miller. That's right. So we have William Miller here, 1831, where we have William Miller, who is preaching the second coming of Jesus Christ. Okay? Sardis needed to prepare themselves for that. So what does God do? He sends the messenger, William Miller. Next, these people are learning about the second coming of Christ, but there are other churches that weren't accepting that. There are many other churches that weren't accepting that. So what did God do? Well, uh, well, what God did, what God did is that God in his great mercy, he sent some more messengers to teach them, look, the churches that are not accepting the second coming of Jesus, those churches now constitute Babylon because they're not accepting the present truth for this time. All right, so those churches represented Babylon. So God, as he continued to teach William Miller and more people were learning from him, we found two individuals, Charles Fitch and S.S. Snow, Samuel S. Snow, who were teaching to behold the, behold the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Jesus is about to return. We can't remain with those people that are rejecting his coming. We can't remain with the scoffers who are saying, where is the coming of the Lord? We can't remain with those individuals because if we continue to hear false doctrines, if we continue to remain around people who are not teaching that Jesus is coming back, well, by beholding, we will become change. If we continue to take in the false doctrine and the false wine of Babylon, then we will be drunk and we will be asleep and Jesus will come and we will be asleep like the disciples. We will not be prepared for his second coming. And so God sent the second angel's movement, the message, uh, 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 in order to call the people out of Sardis into the Philadelphian experience. So you have Philadelphia now that is formed. Now these people strongly believe that Jesus is getting ready to come back and they're preparing their life for the second coming of Jesus. But what happened is that they, mis they, they misunderstood the event that was to occur. They had the time right. The time was correct, October 22nd, 1844. We studied that with Brother Paul, didn't we? October 22nd, 1844, Christ wasn't coming back to this world. He was moving from the holy place into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. So he's moving into the second apartment of the sanctuary and they needed to understand that, those in Philadelphia. So when October 22nd, 1844 came, they were disappointed. So we know that story as the great disappointment. But really what it should be called is a great appointment because Christ had an appointment in the most holy place with the Father and with you and with me to unite us. That day is called the Day of Atonement. at one The union of divinity and humanity being fulfilled and consuming sin in all of our hearts so that we can be one with God. So October 22nd, 1844 actually began with Laodicea, the people of judgment or the people of justice, right? So Laodicea, they needed encouragement because they were, well, Philadelphia needed encouragement because they were just disappointed forming the church of Laodicea. And to encourage those people who moved from the Philadelphian experience to Laodicea, which was a small group of people because many people ended up leaving the faith after being disappointed, so that small group of people to encourage them, God sent or gave understanding to Orrell Kreuzer and Hiram Edson. 
This is Hiram Edson right over here, and this is Orrell Kreuzer. He gave them understanding that actually Christ was moving from the holy place to the most holy place. So now they receive this understanding and they share it with those who form what is known as Laodicea. <clears throat> so we see that God is always sending messengers to encourage and to restore his people after some sort of disappointment or to give them advancing a light so that they can move on unto perfection. So now with Laodicea, these are the people who are supposed to understand justification by faith because they're the people of justice, they're the people of judgment, they're the people who are supposed to have judgment or discernment or a clear discernment or understanding of the character of God. Know ye not that ye shall judge angels? So to be able to judge, you, you have to be just yourself. And the just need to be justified by God. And we are justified by faith. But these people, they lost their understanding of justification by faith. We found that there were two dates that we had written down, 1852 and 1859. And 1859 has a more pointed testimony that says that the testimony to the Laodiceans applies to God's people today. So you have two individuals that God sends. He gives them wisdom and understanding and he sends them in order to teach justification by faith. Their names are A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner. A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner were sent with the message, a most precious message that God gave to them. It presented justification by faith in the surety to restore the church of its Laodicean condition. When those in Sardis were restored, they became Philadelphia. When those in Philadelphia were restored and strengthened, they became Laodicea. When those in Philadelphia were restored and strengthened, they are to move on and begin the formation of the 140 and 4,000. So the message brought by A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner is what begins the formation of the 140 and 4,000. So that's under the fourth angel's movement, the beginning of the formation of the 140 and 4,000. And the completion we know is with the fifth angel. It's clearly complete because the fifth angel is after the close of probation. So that's a general brief scoop now. And I have this statement over here which encourages us. It says, the message given us by A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner is the message of God to the Laodicean church. And woe be unto anyone who professes to believe the truth and yet does not reflect to others the God-given rays. And so the message of, of God to the Laodicean church was sent by Jones and Wagner. So it's very clear, it's very clear that they have been sent to, 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 to heal the, the message that they have, was to heal the church of its Laodicea and lukewarmness. And those who are healed of Laodicea and condition, you see, when God does something, it's always a creative work. Okay? It's a, it's a creative work. So now they are a new people. He says, I make all things new. So now they're no longer Laodiceans because they're no longer people of the judgment. They are people who pass the judgment and begin to form the 140 and 4,000. All right. What's this over here? Ah, this is important. Notice what this statement says. Special truths have been adapted to the conditions of the generations. Let's say that together. Special truths have been adapted to the conditions of the generations as they have existed. The present truth, which is a test to the people of this generation, of which generation? Oh, we're going to study that. Of this generation was not a test to the people of generations far back. If the light which now shines upon us in regard to the Sabbath of the fourth commandment be given to the generations in the past, God would have held them accountable to that light. So to every generation, God gives advancing light, all right? The people back then are not going to be judged according to what we know. Uh, I heard one individual say that the darker it is, the more light you need. And as this earth is continued to go in even more gross darkness, more and more light is going to come. And you and I who are receiving this added light, this increasing light, we're going to be judged according to that. And it's going to be a blessing because as we continue to behold that light which shines in the face of Jesus, we will become just like him. 
We're going to have an even higher experience than Enoch and Elijah. And they were translated. So our experience is going to be even higher than merely translation. This is the experience of the vindication of the character of God. Under the worst circumstances of Earth's history, the Bible calls it a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. This is going to be a time where there is no mediator. A time where, where Christ is no longer doing the work of mediation. The only person who was on this world where there was no mediator for him was Jesus. When Jesus was on this world, no mediator for him. So if he sins, that's it. If he loses, we all lose. So we're going to be living in a time where the, interest, where the work of Christ in the most holy place is, is ceased. And so we're going to stand without sin, without one blot of sin. Just like Jesus in his time. And the beautiful thing is that just like Jesus in his time, he had two, he had two um, uh, guardian angels, and so are we. Christ's two guardian angels were the two covering charge. We're going to have two guardian angels. We're told in the spirit of prophecy that these individuals, they're going to be praying so earnestly. And those that are not praying, their angel is going to have to leave them and are going to be added to those that are praying. And so we'll have an added guardian angel, or we're going to need it. So now we move closer here to just what we are going to study. So uh, let us pray. As we're going to go a lot deeper, friends, let us pray. Our Father, our God, which art in heaven, we again want to thank you for all that you have been teaching us. Lord, we ask that this light may shine more thoroughly in our minds and in our understanding. Lord, we would see Jesus. We would not only just see the time, but we would see Jesus, as Isaiah saw him, high and lifted up, seated on the throne. We would see him just as he is. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Psalms chapter 90. Psalms chapter 90. Let's go to Psalms chapter 90. And when we're there, let's say amen. Psalms chapter 90. Now, I know that I'm not going to be able to finish this study today, and so we're going to finish it on Sabbath afternoon, so tomorrow afternoon, but we'll cover a decent amount of ground today. Psalms chapter 90. Psalms chapter 90, if we're there, let's say amen. I'll read from verse 1 through 4, and then I'll skip down to verse 10 through verse 12. The Bible says, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Underline that word, generations. If you have a pen or if you're taking notes, make sure that you note down that it says that the Lord has been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or even for or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Thou turnest man to destruction and saith, Return ye children of men, for a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as the watch in the night. Please underline the watch in the night. Or note down the watch in the night. Now jump down to verse 10. So we have generations underlined and we have the watch in the night. Verse 10, the days of our years are three score. Now one score is 20. So three score is 60. Three score, because you're doing 20 times three, 60. So three score and 10. So three score and 10 is 70. Three score and ten. And if by reason of strength they be four score years, so eighty, yet is their strength labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off and we fly away. We, who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to thy fear. 
so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days. Underline number our days. Matter of fact, underline teach us to number our days. Underline that whole thing. Teach us to number our days. Why, O oh psalmist, should the Lord teach us to number our days? Well, he says, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. We are told we are to ask God to teach us to number our days in order that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. That we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Now, who is the wisdom of God? Jesus, 1 Corinthians, we find that in 1 Corinthians, I believe it's chapter 1 and verse 24 through 30. You can read it in that section. It says that Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So we are taught to number our days. So we need to be taught by God to number our days in order that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. The reason as to why many in the church and many youth as well in the church leave or aren't interested is because they don't find it to be relevant or meaningful or present to them. We suffer from something called myopia. We have a, myo a myopic uh, view, which is like, it means that you cannot see very far. You can't see further than your nose. You just see exactly what's in front of you, but you don't see further than that. Which, which, which if we look at it in a spiritual sense, we don't consider prophecy. We don't consider even the spirit of prophecy that was given to Ellen G. White. We reject these things. And in rejecting those things, we're in darkness and we don't apply ourselves to wisdom. We don't apply ourselves to Christ. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. We don't apply ourselves to Christ. We don't apply ourselves to wisdom because we haven't learned to number our days. Today, we're going to learn, we're going to be taught by God how to number our days for the purpose of applying our hearts to wisdom. Now, let's go to the book of Mark now. Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13. Mark, Matthew, Mark, New Testament, Matthew, and then Mark. Mark chapter 13. Now, as, we, as you read through Mark chapter 13 in its beginnings, it's the same thing as Matthew chapter 24, and it's also the same thing as uh, Luke chapter 21. This is two days before Christ is about to die. So it's Wednesday. And the disciples went unto him, the Bible says, privately. You can read that in verse 3. It says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? So they were asking Jesus because Jesus was letting them know that this uh, temple that you think is so wonderful is going to be broken down. It's going to be destroyed. And not one stone will be left upon another. This temple is going to be destroyed. So as far as they're concerned, if this temple is going to be destroyed, well, it's the end of the world. The world is coming to an end. So this is where we're going to go to heaven. So, G so they went to Jesus privately. So the conversation, what Jesus is explaining here in, Matthew, in Mark chapter 13, is something that he was speaking to, to the disciples privately. Okay, so, I, I want, so we get insight on a private conversation of Jesus with the disciples. And he's speaking to them and he's letting them know the signs of the end of the world. So this applies to you and me because we are coming to the end of the world right now. Now let's jump down to verse 26. Jump down with me to verse 26 and we will begin to read. And it says, And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. With two things, with great power and glory. 
or verse 27, and then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Let's pause there. I just read that this morning. And when I saw that, it reminded me of Revelation chapter 18. Remember Revelation chapter 18? It says, And I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Now we know that that angel is the fourth angel, and the fourth angel is Jesus. The fourth angel is Jesus. And we saw him in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 14. And Revelation 14 and verse 14, there it says that he is with the clouds and he has a, the crown on his head and he has a sharp sickle. So here Jesus is, it's as though Jesus is mingling Revelation 14 and verse 14 and Revelation 18 and verse 1. He's mingling them, mixing them together. You find a piece of Revelation 14 and verse 14 as he says that the Son of Man is going to come in clouds. And he says that in Revelation 14 and verse 14. And in Revelation 18 and verse 1, we find that he, he says with great power and glory. Great power and glory. So he's clearly speaking of himself. And he says, and then shall he send his angels. Are there angels that we speak about in Revelation 14 and 18? Yes, there are. So I believe that this is a reference to Revelation chapter 14 and Revelation chapter 18. So what does he say about these people, which is you and which is me? The formation of the fourth angel's movement, moving into the into the 144,000. Let's read from verse 28. We're going to learn to number our days. In verse 28, he says, Now learn the parable of the fig tree. When her branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know the summer is near. So ye in like manner, when ye shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh even at the doors. Verily I say unto you that this generation, which generation? This generation shall not pass till all these things be done. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take ye heed, watch. Take ye heed and what? Okay, now in verse 30, make sure you underline this generation. Remember in Psalms chapter 90, we underline generation? Well, we're going to underline it again over here. Underline this generation. Now going back to verse 33, he says, Take ye heed and do what? Watch. Take ye heed and watch and pray. So underline watch and pray. Remember in Psalms chapter 90, we underlined watch of the night. So there's a connection, there's a parallel here that I want you to realize is undoubtable and must be acknowledged. Take ye heed, watch and pray. For ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as the man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants, and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. What is the porter supposed to do? Watch. Verse 35. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh at even, underline even, or at midnight, underline midnight, or at the cock crowing, underline the cock crowing, or in the morning, underline morning. Lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all. 
Watch. When Jesus says something and repeats it, we must pay close attention. So we find that over and over and over again, He is calling us to watch. Now look back in verse 30. In verse 30, the question that we should consider is, which generation is this? According to the context of that statement, which generation is this that Jesus is speaking about? The generation over here that Jesus is speaking about in verse 30 is the generation that will see his coming. Okay? Is the generation that will see his coming. As you read the context of what we've just read, we see that he's speaking about when the, the master comes back to the home, when he returns. So this is speaking about the return of Jesus. So this generation is the generation who will see Jesus return to this world. That's the generation that he's speaking about. Important for us to note that down. This generation is that generation that will see Jesus when he comes. And Jesus says that that generation, that generation will not pass until all things be fulfilled. Okay? This generation will not pass until all things be fulfilled. So this generation is a looking for the coming of Jesus. This generation is, coming from, is looking for the coming of Jesus. So the question that we ought to ask ourselves is because now we're zooming in closer to ourselves. Which generation are we? <sighs> so then what we're studying must be the truth for the final generation. But, 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 but we want to come a little closer, Sister Dorothy. Which generation are we? There's a name. Yes, we are the final generation, but, but we want to see exactly from the Word of God that that is so. Because we have been saying time and time again, Jesus is coming again. This, we are living in the last days. We are the final one. We are the final one. Where is Jesus? Where is He? But when we're able to see prophecy saying it, then it will be very hard for us to deny it. We're learning right now to number our days in order that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. We've been saying that we're the final generation, but have we learned, have we been taught to number our days? When, we're, when we know how to count and find the 2300-day prophecy, nobody can tell us anything about Seventh-day Adventism because we know what we do know. We see that the 2300 days ends October 22nd, 1844, so that's it right there. We know that because we can count, and we counted it, and we see it, and we know it. We learned how to number that, and so we apply our hearts to wisdom, and we have chosen this is the movement to be in. But now we're right before the coming of Jesus. We see what's been going on with that movement. It's lukewarm. It's lackadaisical. And we know that God wants to heal that movement. So we ought to see something that will teach us as we number our days that there is healing for this movement. That this movement will form the church triumphant. So, so, so when we see that, 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 that Jesus teaches us how to see that, that it will happen, then we will apply our hearts to wisdom. This is not a search to know when Jesus is going to come. Because we know not the hour of the Master's appearing. Signs do foretell that the end is nearing. Prophecy is pointing to the great consummation, but we know not the hour when Jesus is going to come. But we are called to number our days. Notice the statement. I don't want to spend too much time on the fact that we, that we can't tell the exact date when Jesus is going to come, but I'll just point out a few statements and a text that will affirm that. Sister White, she said in Selected Messages, book 1, page 191, she says, Letters have come to me asking me if I have any special light as to the time when probation will close. And I answer that I have only this message to bear. That it is now time to work while the day lasts, for the night cometh in which no man can work. I jump down here. There is no command. Matter of fact, I shouldn't jump down. Now, just now, it is time for us to be watching. 
working and waiting. There's no command for anyone to search the scriptures in order to ascertain, if possible, when probation will close. God has no such message for any mortal lips. He would have no mortal tongue declare that which he has hidden in his secret counsels. And so nobody can go out and about saying Jesus is going to come on this day. Nobody knows the day or the hour. We're told that in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. No man knows the day or the hour. But can we know the time that we're living in? We can absolutely know the time that we're living in. Can we know the generation which we are? Oh, we can absolutely, and we need to know the generation in which we are. We need to learn to number our days so that we can apply our hearts to wisdom. So that we can apply our hearts to wisdom. The Bible says, it lets us know that we can know the time and that God will show us the future. In the book of Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 9, it says, Behold, the former things are come to pass. And new things do I declare before they spring forth. I tell you of them. So before new things come, I'm going to tell you about it. Genesis chapter 18, I appreciate this one. Genesis chapter 18 and verse 17, it says, And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? If God wouldn't hide it from Abraham, he surely wouldn't hide it from Abraham's seed. Amen. And Abraham's seed is Jesus. And we are in him and he is in us because he became us. And so if he wouldn't hide anything from Christ, he wouldn't hide anything from you and from me. That's why he has given us the spirit of prophecy, which is the testimony of Jesus. So in these schools of the prophets, it's undoubtable that God will reveal these things to us. In this school of the prophets, it's undoubtable that God would reveal these things to us. For surely the Lord God will do nothing but he revealeth his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. And God would have us know the time. Sister Dorothy, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Friends, our salvation is really and truly nearer than when we first believed. And when we study the generations and as we're going to study the watches, we're going to see that it is even at the doors. Now I need four people. I need four people to grab these four texts. Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 5. Somebody can raise their hands and let me know. They'll grab Proverbs 28 and verse 5. All right, sister. We have sister Aisha, Proverbs 28 and verse 5. Proverbs 4 and verse 7. All right, my sister, sister Troy. Uh, Proverbs 4 and verse 7. Proverbs 4 and verse 7. Ecclesiastes 8, verse 5 and verse 6. Can someone grab for us Ecclesiastes 8, verse 5 and verse 6? All right, brother Paul, you got Ecclesiastes 8, verse 5 and 6. In Psalms chapter 90 and verse 12, we read that, but we'll read it again. Psalms chapter 90 and verse 12. Can one more person get us? Psalms 90 and verse 12. All right, my sister, great. So Psalms chapter 90 and verse 12. Okay. Now, when you have it, just say it with a loud voice and with full confidence so that all may hear you. Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 5. Evil men understand not judgment, but they that seek the Lord understand all things. All right. So what kind of man does not understand judgment? Evil men. Evil men. But, but, but what kind of men seek to... Un but, oh, but they seek... But they that seek the Lord understand all things. What kind of men understand all things? They that seek the Lord. They that seek the Lord. So seeking the Lord, there's something special about individuals that seek the Lord. Who had our second verse? All right. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with, and with all our getting, get understanding. Ah, so with all our getting, what are we to get? 
understanding because wisdom is the principal thing. So as we are learning to number our days so that we can apply our heart to wisdom, we will grow in wisdom and understanding. Brother Paul, you had the book of Ecclesiastes? Yes. All right, so the wise man's heart does what? Yes, understand the time, but according to verse 5, the wise man's heart does what? Discerneth both time and judgment. That word discernment, to be able to discern, to be able to judge, this, this is something that those who are being healed of Laodicea and lukewarmness are experiencing. The people of the judgment are now to learn judgment, discernment. In the book of Daniel, it says that the Lord would give judgment to the saints. You could jot down Daniel chapter 7. You'll find that in there. It says that the Lord will give judgment to the saints. That's in Daniel chapter 7. So, so the wise man's heart discerneth both time and judgment. Because to every purpose there is time and judgment. Psalm chapter 90 and verse 12. So teach us to know our deeds that we may apply our hearts Yes, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. So I've kind of been repeating the same thought so that we can see the gravity and the importance of studying prophecy and of learning to number our days. So now we will understand the generation that we are. The generation that we are, because Jesus says that this generation shall not pass till all these things shall be fulfilled. So we need to know which generation are we. So to understand the generation, we need to understand what exactly is a generation. All right? What exactly is a generation? Numbers chapter 14, verse 33 and verse 34. You could jot that down. You don't have, we don't have to turn there. You could just jot it down. But we read it before. That's where we got the day for a year principle, right? Where uh, therein is said that the children of Israel were in the desert for 40 years. And at, well, he says, I will give you 40 days and uh, a day for, and you would apply a day for a year, meaning they would be in the wilderness for 40 years, right? Now go to Hebrews chapter 3 and let's read verse 7 through verse 10. Hebrews chapter 3 and we'll read verse 7 through verse 10. There Paul is basically repeating what is said in Numbers 14 verse 33 and verse 34. So I will read to you Hebrews chapter 3 verse 7 through verse 10. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 7 to verse 10. There the Bible says, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness. So he's repeating Numbers chapter 14. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works, 40 years. How many years? 40 years. Verse 10 of Hebrews chapter 3. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their heart and they have not known my ways. They have not known my ways. So what is one generation. How many years is one generation according to Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7 to verse 10? How many years is one generation? 40 years. 40 years is one generation. Is one generation. It is the time period required for the maturation of the choice and the direction of a particular generation that is revealed in Scripture as 40 years. 
the maturation of the choice and the direction of a 40-year period, of a, a, a people in 40 years, that is what is called a functional generation. So we're not talking about a biological generation where you have my father's generation, my generation, and if I have children, their generation. No, it's, it, it's a functional biblical generation which is 40 years, 40 years, okay? 40 years. So it is a functional generation. Uh, there's a man by the name of S.N. Haskell, Stephen N. Haskell. He wrote the book, The Story of Daniel the Prophet. He says 40 years, he's an Adventist pioneer, he says 40 years has often been called the allotted time for a generation to settle its destiny either for or against the truth. 40 years. So the pioneers understood this, that 40 years equals one generation. 40 years equals one generation. Now, you remember when God was sharing his character with Moses in Exodus chapter 33, and specifically, though, in chapter 34? When God, he came to Moses and he said, the Lord, the Lord, God, uh, abundant in mercy and in truth, etc. In verse 7 of Exodus chapter 34, there's something special that God says when sharing his character with Moses. And this is what he says. In Exodus 34 and verse 7, you can note that down as you're taking your notes. Exodus 34 and verse 7 and you could also note down Exodus chapter 20 and verse 5. Exodus 34 and verse 7 and Exodus 20 and verse 5. I'll read to you Exodus 34 and verse 7 because we're grasping the principle here. What did this say? It says, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. Brother Paul was speaking about in the character of God, he cannot and he will not clear the guilty. What he will do is he will remove the guilt. He will remove the guilt. And he put it on Christ. The iniquity of us all was laid on him. Visiting the iniquity. Now follow, follow this. This is a principle that's being laid right here right now. He says... Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. So did God say something about the generations? Oh yeah, he did. He said, visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the third and fourth generations. Did he mention anywhere about a fifth generation? I didn't see anything about a fifth generation anywhere here, but, but, but he says unto the third and fourth fourth generation but no mention of a fifth generation if you keep on reading in Exodus 34 but even if you go to Exodus chapter 20 let's go to Exodus chapter 20 and let's read verse 5 Exodus chapter 20 and verse 5 we're studying the Word of God Exodus chapter 20 and verse 5 and there the Bible says in the book of Exodus chapter 20 and verse 5, this is right within the fourth commandment of the living God. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 5. Pardon me, not the fourth commandment, it's actually right before. But it says in verse, from verse 5, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So he says the same thing right there in the commandments. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the third and fourth generation. So if we study the generations, then we will find that if we look at generations, we'll find that judgment falls within the third and fourth generations. Because God's dealings with men are ever the same. Isn't that, that's what we read in Great Controversy, you read that before. The work of God in the earth, remember this statement, presents from age to age a striking similarity in every great reformation or religious movement. The principles of God's dealing with men are ever the same. 
The important movements of the present have their parallel in those of the past. And the experience of the church in former ages has lessons of great value for our time. Lessons of great value. And so let's notice a, a little lesson of great value that we're going to apply to our time. And that's looking at the children of Israel when they received their king. They were asking God for a king in 1 Samuel chapter 8. They said, Lord, we want a king. And the Lord sent Samuel to tell them, look, if you have a king, if, tell them that if they have a king, that means they're going to have to go to war. They're going to have to pay taxes and give the best of the land to the king. They're going to have to give their daughters to the king. You don't want a king like every other nation. But they said, no, we want a king like every other nation. And unfortunately, we find in our church many a times that we say we also want a king, not like every other nation, but like every other denomination. We, we want to rule ourselves, govern ourselves, just like every other. Not following true gospel order, but we, wanna, we pattern ourselves after the other fallen churches. Which is not according to the will of God. But, 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 but if we do that, then we're going to find some falling, some judgment in the third and fourth generation. Now, let's notice that with the children of Israel. They wanted a king. It was not God's will for them to have a king. So they chose to have a king. That was the decision that they made. So notice what happens to those generations. The first king was Saul. The first king was Saul. Now, I'm going to give you our notes. You'll have all of our notes because notice that it's a little bit cut off a little bit. So I'll give you the notes and you'll see it very, very clearly on there when you study it for yourself at home. But the first king was Saul. And the Bible says that Saul was king for 40 years. In the book of Acts in chapter 13 and verse 21. The nice thing about this little chart right here is it has all the text, it has all the verses for you to be able to just simply go to a friend and, and pull it out. And you can do a whole study right there with this as the example. Okay, so 40 years Saul was king, but we find that Saul, he disobeyed God, he, uh, 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 and he rejected God, and eventually the kingdom was given to da David. David was king for another 40 years, right? And then after that, his son Solomon became king. Now, when Solomon became king, which generation is that? That is the third generation. Now, remember, God visits the iniquities of the father unto the third and fourth generation. So when Solomon comes on the scene, we find that Solomon did uh, uh, several wicked things. You know that Solomon got to a place where he offered his children to the God of Molech? Solomon got into devil worship. But Solomon has a book in the Bible. Not just one, two, three. In the Bible. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. So, so what, what, what is this to teach? Because some people say, oh, these two messengers, y'all be talking about A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner. You know that they fell? That they apostatized? So we can't trust what they were saying. Solomon worshipped the devil. But did he have the spirit of prophecy? Yes, he did. And his book is in the Bible. So nobody could come out um, about talking about, oh, we can't trust A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner. We can't trust Mr. White. They're men. They're fallible. X, Y, and Z. Even those two men, they apostatized, etc. When they had light, they had light. And we need to take heed. We need to take heed of that light. The same way we take heed of Solomon's light. When Solomon came on the scene in generation number three, we find some judgments. Because Solomon, we find Solomon started to slip. And Solomon was taxing the people very heavily. The people eventually became very frustrated because they were heavily taxed. So we find within the third generation and then in the fourth generation, we find that there was wars continually between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. It says that in the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 15. So there's a, a little layout of the children of Israel as they had their kings and what was going on. And we see, in fact, that it is so that in the third and the fourth generation, we find judgments falling upon the people of God. So this is packed with Bible text and it, it's really immovable. And I suggest that you put it under much scrutiny to see whether or not it could stand. And if it can't, then, then, then reach out to me because I want to study to show myself approved, a workman rightly dividing the word of God. If this does not stand, then let's, then let's see why not. 
and let's make sure that we're on a solid foundation. But as far as I can see, this thing right here is very, very solid by the grace of God. So now, one generation equals what? 40 years. So one cycle, one cycle is what would be called four generations. Because did, did we see a fifth generation in the Bible? We didn't see a fifth generation. So, so we see that there are four generations. So four generations would be called one cycle. Four generations would be called one cycle. So four generations times 40, because there are 40 years in a generation, would give you 160 years. All right? So one cycle is four generations, and that equals 160 years. Let's go to the book of Joel chapter 1. Joel chapter 1. Joel chapter 1, verse 1 through verse 4, the Bible says, The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuliel. All right? If somebody can read that for us, just need to get a sip of water. Joel chapter 1, verse 1 through verse 4. Can someone read that for us? Joel chapter 1, verse 1 through verse 4. All right. So you notice in verse 3 that it says, Tell ye your children of it. Let your children tell their children and their children another generation. Another generation. So how many generations are identified in this text? Let's read it again. And ye, that's one generation, you. And ye, your children, that's second generation. And let your children tell their children, that's a third generation. And their children, another generation. So that's how many generations? Four. That's four generations. Now in verse four, it goes through the details of the names or how these generations are identified. Names symbolize a mission, remember? So the name will kind of let you know a little bit about each generation. Now it says, that which the palm worm, so that's one generation, hath eaten, hath left, hath the locust eaten. So that's the next one, the locust. And that which the locust has left, hath the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. So how many little pests do we see over here? Four. We see four little pests, which symbolize four generations. These four little pests symbolize four generations. So now let us apply the generations to ourselves. The Lord wants to, us to be taught how to number our days so that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. So we are going to learn right now to number our days. Are we numbering our days so that we can say, oh, this is when Jesus is coming. On this date, Jesus is coming. Is that why we're learning to number our days? No, no, no. We are learning to number our days in order to apply our hearts to wisdom. So let's apply our hearts to Jesus, the wisdom of God. So I made this little chart over here. Made this little chart over here. When did the Seventh Day Adventist movement begin? When did it begin? What's the date? That's right, October 22nd, 1844. 
So that would be the beginning of the generation when applying it to Seventh-day Adventism. Okay, so let's do that. Let's throw that up on the chart. Generation one is 1844. And one generation is how many years again? 40 years. So 1844 to 1884 would be the first generation of the final movement of God. Okay? Because that's what we need to look at. Isn't that what we're, see, what we're showing in Revelation chapter 14? The final movements? So we gotta, we're going to apply right here. 1844 to 1884, that's the first generation in Adventism. So of necessity, the next one is going to be 1884 to 1924. That is the second generation in Adventism. And as you follow along, then you will see undoubtedly that 1924 to 1964 will be the third generation. Do you think there were some things that were going on in the third generation? Of necessity, because he follows the iniquity of the Father to the third and fourth generation. So when we're numbering our days, when we're reviewing our history of necessity, something must have happened over here. Did we see that with the children of Israel? Yes, we did. And God's, the movements of the past have their similarity with those of the present. So next, the fourth generation is 1964 to 2004. Whoa, 2004. 2004 is long gone. And we only read of four generations. So, 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 and we know that four generations is one cycle. And, and there's only four generations over here. So the question that we had asked earlier, remember, is which generation are we? Because Jesus says that this generation will not pass until all these things be fulfilled. Uh, we are that generation, but which generation is it that? The same, the same one. Let's zoom in a little closer. Let's zoom in a little closer. The next generation that would come after 2004 would be from 2004 to 2044. 2004 to 2044. And just for a name, we're just going to put new generation. And we're going to call it the first. Because we can't call it the fifth because there's no fifth generation. You know, there are seven days in the week, right? There's, there's not eight days. As a matter of fact, when they tried to do that, I think it was Napoleon during his time, he tried to make like a 10-day week or something like that. And it didn't work. People were actually going crazy <laughs> because it just wasn't functioning. So, so, so you have to be careful with time. There is one that would seek to change times and laws. We have to be careful with time. And we need to learn time. We need to learn to number our days. Yes, my sister? Huh? Yes. Oh, that would be short. That time would be shortened in righteousness. We'll understand that. We'll, we'll understand that. That's an important principle to apply as we number our days. I appreciate that you brought that up, Sister Dorothy. So, a new generation. But, 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 so, we know we're in that generation, but what generation is that? Let us see. We just read in the book of Joel. Didn't we read in the book of Joel? We read in the book of Joel, we read a few things, right? We read in the book of Joel about the, the, the palmer worm, the locust, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, right? So let us allow the word of God to, 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 to slip this truth right in, all right? Oh, this is just an added piece to the, to the chart, judgment on the third and the fourth generation, all right? When you study Adventist history, there's a lot of things, a lot of issues that go on over here. Matter of fact, let me, let, me, let, me, let me slip this in. Let me slip this in right over here. We're going to come to that. 1888 was in which generation? In the second generation. Okay. In the, within the second generation, right? Because we have 1884 to 1924. So 1888 is, is within that, right? The movement began here, and we find that God was trying to make things happen quickly. 
He was trying to make things happen quickly. And in fact, he could have returned in the first generation. We read that statement that if the people had moved on with the third angel's message in 1844, then the work would have been wrapped up. Christ would have returned. So Christ could have came in the first generation. And Christ could have also came in the second generation as well. Because in 1888, he sent the most precious message, which was supposed to quickly heal the people of God so that it could, the work can be wrapped up. Okay, and Jan Lugbro, he quotes Sister Ellen White, who says that the work would have been wrapped up in two years, since 1888. That means 1890, the work could have been wrapped up. 1890, 1891, the work could have been wrapped up, but we're still here. Huh? Right, right. So what we, what we would have to do, so... So we'll study the generations first, but then the generation, there's something that goes deeper within the generation, which we won't have time to cover today. We're going to cover that tomorrow afternoon. And when we see that, we're going to understand the fullness of kind of what the seeds I'm kind of sowing right now. I'm just planting some ideas, some thoughts in our minds so that later when we see further, we'll more co properly comprehend what you're saying right now. Because it's very important. But I just want to identify that Christ could have came in the second generation. But we find the third generation that judgment came. In the 1950s, there were two men, Donald Short and Robert Wieland. And those two individuals in the 1950s, they were looking to bring back the 1888 message. In fact, they have a book called 1888 Reexamined. And that book is a wonderful book that goes through the history of the 1888 message. And they brought, that book, they brought that attention to the general conference because they saw that the church was not preaching the message that was given in 1888. So they said, we need to go back to this. But unfortunately, the leadership said, uh, no, we don't. We're just going to move forward with what we have. And, it was, and, and they were really hurt. So the book 1888 Reexamined, and I highly suggest that you read that. But as a preface to that, I would also highly recommend a book called 1888 An Introduction by Robert Whelan and Donald K. Short. 1888 An Introduction. It's a wonderful book that goes through the message that was given in 1888 in simple terms. It's so beautiful. But that's an example of the third generation. We find that God was looking to help them with Robert Whelan and Donald K. Short to bring back the 1888 message, but it was resisted, and we find judgment in that time. Because in the 1960s, we find a man by the name of... I didn't even have it in this PowerPoint because, I don't, because it wasn't really my intention to go into it. But a man by the name of uh, uh, um, Walter Martin... And Walter Martin, he was writing a book called The Kingdom of the Cults. It was a book that he was writing for his PhD. He had a photographic memory. He was a very intelligent guy. He was also a Calvinist, which is what confused me, because if he's so smart, then how can you be a Calvinist believing in predestination and things like that? So Walter Martin, he was threatening to call Seventh-day Adventism a cult. And then he met with the people in the General Conference, and it was there that they, the, those leaders were denying our faith unfortunately denying our faith. So judgment was falling, where we find that leadership is denying the faith and came out with a book called Questions on Doctrines. And that book is actually a very, very good book, but there's enough poison in there for you to be lost. If I give you a glass of water and just put a little bit of cyanide in there, put a little bit of bleach in there, you think I'm going to drink that? Absolutely not. That thing is deadly. And that's the same thing with that book, Questions on Doctrines, where in it, I actually have the book, where in it, it says things like Christ didn't partake of our nature, of our fallen nature. If that's true, then God, then he can't help me. If Christ wasn't tempted to break the seventh commandment, then I don't have a savior from breaking the seventh commandment, you see. So Christ, he felt our temptation because he partook of our nature. He took our nature. He felt that temptation, but he never desired to sin because he had a mind that would always destroy the temptation. And so if you're telling me he doesn't have my weak nature, then I don't have a help. And so that book brings up that point and a couple of other things that are destructive to the pillars of our faith. And so that is what was going on in the third generation. And as you continue to study in the fourth generation, the things going on in our schools, teaching uh, 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 things like, like, like uh, um, evolution and a bunch of other nonsense. 
been going on in our church. But it wasn't our object again to even get into that. I want to look at the fact that in those four generations, they are identified in the book of Joel, the first as the palm worm, the palm worm eating up that pest and leaving leftovers for the locusts, and the locusts eating up and leaving leftovers for the canker worm, and the canker worms eating up and leaving leftovers for the caterpillar. And so these, these are what you may call, or this, these four generations is what you may call the generation of degradation. You find degradation going on throughout the church in these four generations. Much degradation. If you just take time and study. Now, I don't promote studying apostasy because you keep studying apostasy, then you're going to become apostate because by beholding you become changed. But we need not be ignorant of the enemy and his devices. We should be aware of the things that the enemy has been doing in our church so that we can, walk, so that we can meet it. Sister White speaks in the book First Selected Messages about an iceberg, which is the alpha of apostasy. And she says that there will be an omega of apostasy and that it must be met. The alpha of apostasy was, the, was, the, was just the top. You know, it's just the top of the iceberg. But everybody knows who, who knows anything about icebergs knows that the bottom is way much larger than the top. And so the omega of apostasy is much larger than we can ever imagine. The Alpha of Apostasy was coming in through the medical missionary lines through a man by the name of J.H. Kellogg. The Lord called Kellogg, John Harvey Kellogg, the Lord said, the Lord, on this inspiration, he was called the Lord's physician. That brother was smart and he was blessed by God. But by reason of his wisdom, have mercy. Just like the enemy of all souls, by reason of his wisdom, he was corrupted. And he went into what is called pantheism, which is believing that everything is God, that God is in everything. God is in the pulpit. God is in the wood. God is in the truth. God is, it, God is that. And God is in you. Therefore, you are. Oh, my goodness. Isn't that what the serpent was saying? And so this man, he wrote a book called Living Temple. And that most detrimental book was preaching and teaching that thing. Now it came through the medical missionary line, which is the right arm of the gospel, right? And so the Omega has been coming through the ministerial lines, where error and heresy has been coming into our seminaries. When you study our history and study our, the things that are going on in our school, the work of the devil is in the head of our faith. He doesn't care about us. What he wants is he wants the leadership to be poisoned because he knows that if the heart is poisoned, then that blood is going to flow throughout the body and the body is going to be weak. But God is preparing a people that will know and understand how to do CPR. Right, Brother Paul? They're going to know how to do CPR to restore God's church. Now, this is the generation of degradation. So now, which generation are we? Let's go to the book of Joel chapter 2. Let's go to Joel chapter 2 to see which generation are we. We're knowing and learning how to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Joel chapter 2. Let's jump down to verse 25. Joel chapter 2. Looking at from verse 25. <laughs> I love this thing right here. And the Bible says, and I will restore. Let's say that together. I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palm worm. My great army, which I sent among you. So what is he going to do? He's going to do what? He said, I will restore. I will restore to you what? Years. The years. That what? And, 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 and he mentioned the four pests. What were those four pests? They were four? They were four generations. So he says, I will restore to you the years from those four previous 
generations. So this generation is not the generation of degradation. This generation is not any one of those pests because we will be restored everything it is that they ate up and that they lost. So this is not the generation of degradation. Rather, this generation is the generation of restoration. We are the generation of restoration. And with us, God will restore the old waste places. We are what the Bible calls the repairers of the breach, the restorers of the old waste places. We are the ones who are to rebuild Jerusalem. Didn't the children of Israel have to go back and rebuild Jerusalem? 457 B.C. We are called to rebuild and to restore Jerusalem. And even to rebuild the streets and the walls. You see, how many kings called for the rebuilding of Jerusalem? How many kings? It was three. Doesn't that represent the three angels' message? Oh, yes, it does. Three kings. Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes. But brothers and sisters, did you know that there are not merely three angels' messages, there are four angels' messages. So of necessity, there is also a fourth decree. You can find it in the book of Nehemiah. It wasn't my intention to go there, but this thing is so sweet. In the book of Nehemiah, you can read it there, that there's another king who, said, who Nehemiah, he's crying, and the king says, why are you crying for? And he explains that, that Jerusalem is not fully rebuilt. We have to rebuild the street, and we have to rebuild the wall. And the king makes a decree to rebuild the wall. Fourth decree. Fourth angel's message. There's not another message, you know. That was the last decree. That was it. To rebuild the wall. That's a whole study in itself, but, but, but I have to stick right here. We're learning to number our days. So here we are. We are the generation of restoration. And to this generation of restoration, you know what, God's, you know what God is going to do? Look at verse 29. Look at verse 29. What is God going to do to this generation of restoration? It's verse 29. It says, And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids. And in those days I will do what? We're talking about the latter rain. I will pour out my spirit. Fourth angel has the latter rain. Did we see that before? In Revelation chapter 18 and Revelation chapter 14, we found Jesus on the cloud. The cloud represents the angels. When we see clouds, we know that there's rain coming. So that's the latter rain. So you pull out his spirit, and I will show wonders in heaven and on the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness. Did the sun turn into darkness in the past? Was it a dark day? Well, we studied about the dark day, right? With the church of Sardis, there was a dark day. And the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord, his second coming. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion, for in Mount Zion, that's where you found the 144,000. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Oh, this was the book of Joel that I just read. Joel and chapter 2, we read from verse 28, as we see where the generation of restoration, to verse 32, which points out the latter rain, and which points out the time of the end, and what's going on thereabouts, and which points out that deliverance is going to come to those that are on Zion, which is in the city of peace, Jerusalem. They will not be touched by any plagues. That's what this is speaking about here. So now let me zip through as I close. Let me zip through these final points as I close right here. As I close right here, let me zip through. This generation is the generation. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 4, Who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first and the last, I am He. God has called this generation of restoration from the beginning. It's not a coincidence that you've been attending this church. It's not a coincidence that God brought you in this place in such a time as this. Understand that you have been brought in this generation, in this final movement. Because you know what the Bible says, but ye are a chosen generation. God has chosen you. Will you accept the call? Because you see, many are called, but few are chosen because few accept the call. You have been called. And God simply needs a yes from you. 
He says, you are a chosen generation of royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people, not weird, but peculiar. That you should do what? Show forth, so preaching, showing forth the praise of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So this generation has been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. And this generation has a special work to do. It is this generation that will preach this gospel of the kingdom. And when this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness unto the nations, and then shall the end come. This generation shall not pass until all these things shall be fulfilled. So this generation is going to preach this gospel, the marvelous light, as a witness. We will show forth. You see how it's connected? I put it in those colors so you can see the connection. And then shall the end come. And the beauty of it all, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6. For God who commanded the light, the gospel, to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God which is in the face of of Jesus Christ. We are that generation. We are that generation. We end here. We end here. We are that generation that welcomes the end. Do you love the idea that Jesus can come in this generation? Do you love the thought that Jesus could come in this generation, in a few short years. Even so, Lord Jesus, come. So we're learning to number our days, and there is more applications to the numbering of our days that we will do. In the beginning, we had us underline generations, but there was another word that we had us underline, and it was the word that Jesus told all of us to do. He says, what I say unto them, I say unto you, watch. So there's something about watching that we need to understand in this generation. So as we continue to learn how to number our days, Jesus is going to teach us how to watch because we are to be the watchmen on the walls of Zion, watching for the soon return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you love him? Amen. Are you sure you love him? Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. Let's speak to the Father. Our Father which art in heaven, oh how we love your coming. We love to hear of your appearing. And we're grateful that you are teaching us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. As we continue to do this, we ask for much more of your promised Holy Spirit, so that we can be filled with all of you and none of us that this world will be lightened with your glory. In the precious and most holy name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.